Hey kids, it's time to get some SML podcast all up in that. What's up, everyone? This is the SML Podcast. I am your host, Joe. It is the hangover from episode 500, uh, but we, we got to keep your spirits up. We got we got shit to do, people to talk to, things that have to be discussed on the show, and Pernell Vaughn's to welcome. So, Pernell, how are you doing? I got a hangover. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so fucking drunk still. <laughs> I'm drunk. Nah, like, I have that feeling of a hangover. Like, I have... I think it's like some weird sinus in my bob today where you know where you don't even know where it comes from. You just wake up and you start living your day and you start get groggier and groggier and you get dizzy. You're like, why am I dizzy? I ate breakfast. I walked. I peed. What did I, I did everything I was supposed to do. And your sinus just said, you know, today is the day I want to be a bitch. And then <laughs> they just take you down a peg. But sick time doesn't grow on trees. So <laughs> you're suffering oh, around all your coworkers. And I just made it happen, baby. But um, I still stand to be pretty on the money like i was at a friend's house earlier for dinner and i did warn them in advance look i'm not feeling so hot if you're okay with that i'll come over and the whole time we were like watching vine videos and talking about like goofy politics and like just catching up on normal life and talking about the board game convention i went to and like here and there i'm like oh standing up's difficult i'm gonna sit down now (laughs) it was a very weird feeling Hmm. and random side thing it's a this, this may even be technically kind of plugging some other thing but so fun conversation i had today so I'm sure. Have you ever heard of that guy who does YouTube stuff named like Donkey or something? No, I don't follow YouTube personalities really. Neither do I. But every once in a while, someone will say, "Pernell, check out this vid." And I'm like, "What's that?" I was like, check me out. Trust me, you'll appreciate the video. So it was a video by some guy who goes by that name, and he was talking about game reviews. And I swear to God, he hit so many buttons. I was like, "I know you're supposed to be a comedy podcast, but I'm on that level. I I get this so much." And it's kind of, I feel like, an embodiment that we try to do on this show, too. In that, when you do a game review, it's your review. Like, it's your perspective, no one else's. Mm -hmm. And your opinion is not beholden to the masses. And what that means is, it might be, I might get a game that's like a top-tier game. Like, I don't know, name a top-tier game right now. Because my brain is farting. But basically... A uh, hot release title. I'm reviewing it. I'm like, you know, I'm just not feeling this right now. This just isn't cutting the mustard. And here's why. Now go down all the paces and everything. But, you know, people are like, no, you're supposed to like it because it's really good. Why is it really good? I don't know, but I know it's really good because it's popular and it's got a lot of money vested into it. Like, no, that's, it's that's how I that, felt with Red Dead 2. Were you not on the train for that? Like, wasn't more too fond of it? No, I, it just it didn't do anything for me. I I think the game is fucking gorgeous. I've never seen a more beautiful game in my life, but it it's just too slow. It's too realistic. Like I know they're going for realism, but you know, it, it's a video game. Let me have fun instead of giving me chores to do and slowing everything down and making me manage my food and my health and I just let me let me play. Yeah, and it's like someone can hear you talk about that and go, well, you just don't know what you're talking about because clearly those are very intricate systems. Like, I'm not saying the systems are not intricate. I'm saying I don't enjoy them. I'm not saying you can't. I'm saying I don't. I'm yeah. telling you why. And that's what matters because if you put nuance into what you say and then people listen to it, they can decide if your negative is your po- is their positive. It's like, he thinks it's too realistic. I want this to be realistic. Sign me the hell up. But he still gained that knowledge from your review, despite the fact that you disagree with what he wants to hear. He still yeah. learned it from you. So it's like, I just, I like the fact that he outright was like, I, that you just, people don't have to like the same stuff. Just because it's a big budget game doesn't mean it's got to get like high kudos. It just has to be your opinion and it has to be your true opinion. And that's what matters. And, and I'll admit, sometimes you might get a review where like someone's like, oh, well, Clearly, you didn't understand this this mechanic or something, so maybe that's why you were a little bit off. And at that point, that might be me going, oh, shoot, you're right. That's a mechanic I didn't understand. Maybe I missed that little tutorial snippet, 
And because they kept bombarding me with tutorials, I was like, fuck it, I just want to kill things. And then you, for, you didn't realize that you could freaking side roll or whatever, you know. But for the most part, I feel like that's how it should be. Like, people should just respect what people have to say about games and use reviews for what they are, which is, I want to buy this. I'm genuinely interested in this game, but you already got it for free. And I want to hear what you think of it by description to give me an impression of is this what I'm looking for too, regardless of whether you like it or not, though that would be nice if you like it. I want you to tell me enough about it so I can make my own decision. Yeah. And that's the mean bean machine that I like to cavort with. I like to think we do that on the show. Oh, you damn why we do that. It's just it's something I thought about because uh, the reason that it got, it got perked up for me. So I'll go, it's a little bit of a preheader. So next week, I should be ready for the Wolfenstein review. So, um, but as you know, Ooh, you know outlets that, yeah, buddy. <laughs> but as you already know, there are already outlets writing articles about things about the game, you know. And the most prominent one is the microtransactions are out of control. And as you know, I hate microtransactions. Never liked mm-hmm. them, and I'll likely never utilize the thing. I just fucking hate them. However, I respect that industry uses microtransactions to make that extra buck when they need it. So my main stipulation is keep the microtransactions away from power, please. I don't want to have to pay money to get juiced up. I don't want to pay money to win the game. Everything needs to be optional, and everything that is a gameplay mechanic needs to be available to me without paying money, period. And it doesn't have to be one of those things where it's like, well, technically, if you don't pay for it, the grind will take so long that you'll be forced to pay. Like, no, I don't want that either. So when I was reading these articles, I was like, you know, why is it being read? I was looking at the headers and they were like, oh my God, too many microtransactions. People were complaining in the comments like, you know what? I don't even want to read it because I'm going to play it myself and determine it. And while I'm still getting my, my feet wet to the point I'm not ready to review it yet, I can say I think that's way overblown. Like it's solely for cosmetics. It's for cosmetics. Mm-hmm. Basically the Fortnite and Team Fortress system. Yeah. Like like I I genuinely don't get the fabubba. Like Personally, even if I even if I can buy some of them with in-game money, I'll probably never buy it unless I just have an influx of cash that I don't want to spend on any upgrades. No, I'm not going to because I'm playing the game. I can't even see my character. <laughs> well, I care. I just want to play a fun game. And I feel that was, that was my thing. Where I was like, man, they're way overblowing this thing. Why is why is it such a big deal here? Everyone, it's like I'd prefer if they never existed, but they do. So make it exist in a way where it's not obtr- intrusive. That's all I want. Yeah, and cosmetics is a good way to do it. I think Dauntless does it the same way. They they don't really sell things that can help you in-game. Like, they, they sell weapon skins. They don't sell more powerful weapons. Yeah, and that's what I like. I'm they sell that emotes much. and uh, different outfits that you could wear. It's... You know, I, I didn't even have a problem dropping a couple of bucks to get. They have an arrival emote when you show up on an island for a hunt. The guys drop down from the sky and they do a pose. And you mm-hmm. could find a whole bunch of different things that your character can do as their intro. Like one, a popular one is like the Terminator entrance where there's just like an orb of light. And you <laughs> appear kneeling and then you stand up. That's the one, cool. the one I paid money for because it was so goddamn good is you come crashing face down into the ground and bounce once, still face down in the dirt. Oh, like a cartoon, like yes. Let's fight, guys. Yes, yeah, I, I like love this it. Up. See, I'm all about wacky, cartoony mess like that myself. That's a good thing. See, and at that point, if you're like, hey, you know, I've been playing this for a bit, I'm enjoying this, but it would be nice if my guy did a little different and now, you know, arrived a little differently. I want a new animation. Yeah, it's fine. Nothing wrong with paying that. And if you decided not to, your gameplay experience mechanically won't change. But yeah. if you do, it's just, hey, a little bit of extra flair that I want to, you know, show off for myself or for people watching me play the game. So, and I'm fine with that. I will likely never be the guy to complain about that. I have been the guy that was like, remember the days when you unlocked that stuff using codes? <laughs> I have been that guy. And sometimes I'll still be that guy. But in the well, end... Well, let me tell you, kids. <laughs> there was a game called Golden Eye. The eye. There was neither an eye nor gold in it. Well, there was a gun that was made of gold, but you couldn't sell it, so it could have been plated gold. We don't know. <laughs> the important part is you can unlock things without money. You unlock them with effort. <laughs> oh, the youngins refer to it as playing the game. 
Do you little sons of bitches even know the Konami code? <laughs> oh, shut up, Granddad. Of course we do. It's circle, circle, square. 360 degree tilt. Listen here, yeah. you little shit. <laughs> <laughs> that will be me when I'm old, by the way. I have no qualms with it either. I'm looking forward <laughs> to it. Like I tell people to this day, seniors earn the right to be awful. They earn it. Don't get me wrong. I don't want them to be awful to me. But, hey, if they decide they want to be, you lived a long life. You dealt with shit that I wasn't even alive for. If it made you a grumpy curmudgeon who wants to bitch about everything, knock yourself out. This is your twilight years. You earned this mess. Go <laughs> nuts. Ain't my place to tell you nothing. Like, I've had some friends who's had, like, grandparents, like, weird, awful grandparents. And they're, like, talking, like, I'm sorry, man. My grandparent, my grandpa should have said that. I'm like, look, dude's old. He ain't changing. He is set in his ways. And he'll die eventually. So let him live his life the way he wants at this point. It's done. If he changes, that's great. But hey, he's at that point now. Let him live. Let him do his thing. He earned it. How did he earn it? By not dying. <laughs> By living <laughs> through crap and not dying. It is a testament. <laughs> shut, shut, I know, contrary to popular belief, living that long is a testament. It's something to that. <laughs> I'd be happy to live towards 60. Happy to. All this damn. My, my fingers are crossed. I make it to 39 at this point. You'll be a 39. <laughs> You'll be pissing in the grass at 40 even. I'm sure. Sweet. Damn Still right. doing this awful like show. The- hey, we're going for a thousand, man. That's the goal. We'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, speaking of the show, we have work to do. Should we get to it? <laughs> yeah, let's do it before I start running mucus all over my shirt. All right. First game to talk about tonight is called Forager, developed by Hopfrog, published by Humble Bundle, released July 30th on Switch, PC, and PS4 for $19.99. The highly popular and quirky idle game that you want to actively keep playing. Explore, craft, gather, and manage resources. Find secrets and build your base out of nothing. Buy land to explore and expand. Purnell, tell us about Forager. So, if you may recall, in ancient times, those times being December 2017, I reviewed a game for this show that went by the name of Plantera. Plantera was a game where you grew plants and harvested crops and farmed animals and a bunch of junk. Ultimately, the point was you got money, you expanded, you wash, rinse, repeat it. It wasn't even a game so much as a thing that you did. And suffice to say, I was still pretty addicted to it. So Forager, unsurprisingly to me, is my favorite game this week. I'm just going to say it right the hell now. <laughs> it took that formula and put a game in it. <laughs> so what it is, is you are just a little dude. You're just a little dude and you are living, just living. What does living entail? Well, when you start the game out, you can build a few things. You can build a smithy and you can build a forge and you start with a pickaxe. And if I remember correctly, that is probably, oh, in a backpack, I'm sorry, a pickaxe and a backpack. So you can take the pickaxe and you can see a bunch of trees around you. So you just think, hey, hit them with a pickaxe because clearly that's how you chop down trees. But whatever. <laughs> hit the trees with a pickaxe, chop them down, collect wood, sometimes fruit. You chop down berry bushes to get berries. You chop down or you hit ore with a pickaxe to get ore. Berry has of ore. And you use that stuff to create things. What things? A cornucopia of crazy shit. You can create <laughs> fish traps. You can create... Um, let me see, new equipment like gloves and boots. You can create sewing machines, banks, uh, portals, alchemy pots. It gets ridiculous. And the way it works is that as you're doing this, as you're creating things and expanding your little island world, you start to realize that I want more places to explore. This island is getting real cramped because as you build stuff and all, as you knock stuff down, it kind of grows right back. The game keeps you in the loop. And you're like, I want to get off this island. I want to do more. So you can buy land to expand your world. How do you buy land? You print money. You literally mint money with ingredients and then take the money you've <laughs> minted and you buy land. And whenever you buy land, it's a brand new place. It's a randomized place. You don't know what's going to be there. And there's honestly cool stuff you can discover. You can discover a little house where you can change clothes. You can discover NPCs that offer you little quests. And if you complete their quests, you can get like cosmetic items and stuff from them. There are other like venues. There's dungeons where you can like solve puzzles and get cool stuff. Um, There's museums. There's there's shrines that gives you special powers like increase... um, harvesting for like 30 minutes or whatever it's just it constantly feeds your need to expand and grow 
And it, it, it's, I was going to say it's not helped by, but it really is helped by the fact that you also level up for, you get experience for every little thing you do. Every tree you chop down, every little monster that shows up on the screen that you kill with a pickaxe and eventually swords. Um, you get experience. And for every time you level up, you get a skill point. What skill points do? Unless you go to a 64 skill tree. Starts out really small. We're talking like choose between three things or so. But every time you pick something, everything around it, like th- by in a three by like a three tile surrounding, becomes exposed as the next thing you can unlock. So it keeps teasing you with the next big thing. You unlock, I don't know, like I said, the, you unlock the sewing machine, or you unlock the the well, or something like that. You unlock twenty percent income increase when you sell stuff. You unlock marketplaces that you can build. And every time you unlock a new thing, new stuff shows up. So you know, like next level, I'm going for that. So now you just want to keep mining. You want to keep searching. You want to keep breaking things. And it can even feel a little overwhelming sometimes because you'll find yourself going, my inventory's full, but I haven't built anything that lets me store stuff yet. What do I do? Or, oh, crap, I want to put this in the museum, but I don't want to give it up for the museum. What do I do? And eventually that means you need to build a new backpack, but you have to get to the point where you can build a backpack. But guess what? Do whatever the hell you want, when you want, and it'll happen when it happens because the game is also completely freaking stress-free. You get killed by a monster, game throws you right the fuck back in. Yeah, you will stop. It'll say game over, but then you just press start and you go right back to the game. Like, yeah, you'll be killing stuff because it's fun to kill enemies and stuff, and it's just part of the fun because they also drop loot when you kill them. But there's no pressure for surviving. It's just the only pressure is waiting to reboot the game. That is yeah. literally it, which to me is pressure enough to not die. But <laughs> there's nothing that you genuinely lose by dying. And I genuinely like that. I really, really do. This is truly the clicker with a game inside. You play it. You just do a bunch of stuff before you go to bed. You go to sleep eventually. You wake up. You live out your day. You go home and you do it again when you're about to go to bed. It's the perfect game for that. I'm enamored with it. And yeah. it's it just sounds like so, you really like it. <laughs> I really, really like it. Like I didn't expect to like it this much. It it consumed me. And then you get to the point where you want to organize stuff. Like at first, you know, when you just have your one island, then your two, then your three, then your four, you're haphazardly placing stuff down because you don't have any real plan. You're just like, I can build this now. I'll just dump it there. But then eventually you're like, okay. I need to organize this shit. I need my banks over here. I need my printing press over there. I need my inscribing <laughs> to them over here. And you're start, you start destroying stuff to rebuild stuff because you want to organize set of islands now. You want to be able to plan a route. I'm going to go around this island, stop here to collect this stuff, which I'll then take, like I'll collect the ore here, which I'll then take to the smithy to break it down and get freaking ingot. And then I'll go to this place, which I'll then use to print keys, to open treasure chests, which I find when I buy islands. You know, it's just, you just keep... You just get in, absorbed in it. And the game is really good at letting you forget what time it is and how much time you spent on it. It's really, <laughs> really good and soothing and fun. Uh, I love it. The only question left is 20 bucks. What's your verdict? Buy the hell out of it. It's worth every freaking penny. It's worth the $20. Like I said, if you, if you like the idea, like if you like games like Stardew Valley, Harvest Moon, um, obviously not, not for the purpose of like, you know, marrying the pair, the characters and stuff, but you just like the exploration and the building an economy and all that kind of stuff of those kinds of games. This is the game for you. It's so good. While you're waiting for Animal Crossing, buy this. There's the <laughs> statement I need to make. While you're waiting for AC, buy Forager. I don't think you'll regret it. Awesome. Sounds good. Thank you. <laughs> Next game to talk about is called Mighty Switch Force Collection, developed and published by Way Forward. <laughs> Released July 25th on Xbox One, Switch, PC, and PS4 for $19.99. Four great puzzle platformers in the same place at the same time for the first time ever. Pernell, tell us about it. Well, I have I genuinely have weird feelings about the four games bit, but I'll get into that in a second. So, fun fact, I know I just said Forge is my favorite game on this episode, but for a long, long time, Mighty Switch Force was one of, if not my favorite games on the 3DS. It is a quality, quality franchise done by Wade Forward that has music by the always excellent Jake Kaufman. Hell yeah. And the premise is very straightforward and simple, though they kind of change it with slight variations throughout the game. But it's overall the same thing, which is that you are a civil servant. First game, you're a cop. Second game, you're a firefighter. And then you go back to being a cop again. But you're a Patricia Wagon. That's the most ridiculous punny name that I'm surprised more people haven't caught on to, but I love it. It's Patricia Wagon. Um, did you get it? 
You get the no. pun. What's what's the what's, what's short for Patricia? Pat. Patty. No, there's another. Yeah, say the full name. Patty wagon. There you go. There you go. Son of a she's bitch. Like, she's a cop. <laughs> <laughs> so in the first uh, game, <laughs> it's so terribly funny. I love it. Why didn't I get that? <laughs> you and a lot of other people never got it because they don't even call her Patty wagon. They call her Patricia wagon. So unless you put the two together, like oh, Patty. Patricia's um, Patty short for Patricia Patty wagon. Oh crap. Uh, <laughs> this is glorious. I love it. But um, the game itself, usually the first game at least revolves around you being a police officer chasing after the hooligan sisters who are a group of, well, hooligan sisters who have escaped police custody and they are wreaking havoc on the city with weird goo they have for some reason that creates monsters and stuff, whatever. It's ridiculous, but the premise doesn't matter because the game is where it's at. And the way the game works is that you, as a cop, are entering into a bunch of levels. You a good number of them, actually, too. And your goal is to find all five sisters throughout the stage and then find your robot companion to board and exit the level. So the way you explore the stage is that you have a gun and you can jump. But the main mechanic that makes it mighty switch force is that the press of a button, there are special blocks on the stage that can go in and out of the, from the background to the foreground and vice versa. So you are generally taking opportunities to switch blocks in and out so you can hop around on them as platforms. Sometimes you need to use the blocks to kill enemies. Like you basically press them against the screen and they die. And I like how they have a little like, screen cracking animation whenever it happens. So it's kind of cool that way. Also, you, if you die in that. You could do it to yourself. <laughs> yep. And man, will that happen a lot until you get used to that timing. Because when you're trying to hit those par times, yeah, each level has par times. But thankfully, it's not three stars. It's just one. One star. Thanks, WayForward. Um, and you get an achievement when you <laughs> slam yourself into the screen. <laughs> yes, you do. It is glorious it's like it's such a good freaking time like you're going for these part times you're going after these sisters and you know always and honestly a lot of the time they want you to be very like on point like to get the part time you have to do it damn near perfectly which a lot of people might be like oh no but for me i'm like no that's great i want to be able to master the stages and then once i master the stage then it's like okay now i gotta do better than my friends or whatever if i have friends playing this game which you should because it's a fantastic game anyway so the game I just described is the first game, Mighty Switch Force. The second game is called Mighty Switch Force Hyperdrive Edition. And what I said earlier about the three game thing instead of four, I meant it because of this. Hyperdrive Edition is the console version that they produced sometime after the original 3DS version came out to capitalize on, you know, resolution of the screen, high resolution graphics, you know, usually. Hyperdrive stuff. HD. Hi, oh, see, you got it, baby. I love their puns. <laughs> They even added a bunch of stages to the game that weren't in the original version. So for the most part, unless you're going for like the achievements that are in most likely in the original game, as well as the hyperdrive version, you can likely just play hyperdrive edition and just have a great time with it. Cause you're getting all the content that would have been the hyperdrive uh, in regular mighty switch Force. You can even unlock a pixelized version of Patty for that game and your phone. The nice. third game in the collection is mighty switch force two. And that game is a similar gameplay mechanic, but now instead of a police officer, the, she is a fire, but a fire officer. So now the pun no longer works. Boo, freaking who? <laughs> but she's still Patricia Wagon, and she still got a job to do. And in this case, she is she's replaced her pellet gun for a fire hose, and she is putting out fires around town and saving the newly reformed Hooligan sisters. Still five sisters, still in peril, still need to grab them and exit the stage. And it's still pretty much the times. Still part time, still one star. But now they added an ugly baby you have to find. And when you find the baby, you kick it and say, You're saved. <laughs> it's glorious. I love kicking that baby. It's a fun time. <laughs> so, in addition to going for part times, you're also looking for ugly babies. And you think I'm being a jerk, but no, it's called the ugly baby. It's, I love it. Um, but the game, the mechanics have, are fairly similar with the exception of like now enemies can be pushed with your fire hose. Some enemies can still just be killed by getting hit with the water. Fire gets put out by hitting it with a constant stream of water. Larger fires take more time to put out. They added new enemy types and new blocks, like there's mud blocks where you have to spray them enough so that they dissolve. And sometimes the sisters could have been captured by like, these little weird like hobbly guys. We have to fill them with water so they explode and release the sisters. How they haven't drowned before you rescued them? Ooh, whatever. But it's still <laughs> fun to just spray them with water. Sister pops out, collect her, and save the day. 
I will say part times are harder to get in this game. I think though they and they up the challenge a bit on getting the part times, but it's still a fantastic fun ride of a game. And then the last game is one that actually up until this collection I never played it, and that is Mighty Switch Force Academy. It was originally released on Steam back I think like 2015 or 2016. And it is basically Mighty Switch Force, the original style of gameplay, with a few changes. One, they've added co-op. So you can do stages with up to four players. Ooh. I think that's up to like how the player wants to do it. Because I mean, I don't think it really adds anything. It's just more another way to play the game. And when you do multiplayer, there's actually different part-times. Like You can go for the part-time in single-player, and there's a part-time for multiplayer. So it tracks them both separately, which I appreciate. In addition to that, the second major change is that instead of being scrunched down like how the 3DS had it where you're like walking around the screen scrolls, now every stage is the entire screen. So think like, um, I'm trying to think of a game that did that. I want to say Castlevania did this back on the PS3 and Xbox 360. That multiplayer Castlevania where you explore like joint, like joint sections of stages um, where it just shows the entire map. So if everyone's playing, everyone can see where everyone is going. And the benefit to that to me, aside from that element, is that you can see the entire stage. So you can see the layout when you start and go, I'm going to plot my course right now. I'm going to go this way, grab this sister here, come around here. It's easier to plan your routes instead of having to do the level first, then learning where everything is, and then going, now when I come back, I know the route I want to take. No, you can see the entire level. You can plot a course right away. And they've even added a couple of levels from the original game as like bonus courses so you can play them with this new style, both multiplayer and the full screen spread. Nice. And honestly, it is a fantastic game. You cannot go wrong at all with any of the Mighty Switch Force titles. They're all just fantastic little puzzle romps. They aren't boring. The music is solid. And honestly, I I just love them. I've always loved them. And I still, I mean, like I said, before I got this collection, I bought the original games back in like, oh, 2011, 2012, whenever the first one came out. And I bought the second one on release day, too. And I still listen to their OSTs. Like, I've been listening to them to this very day. Um, yeah, they're good music. Yes, it is. Jake it's makes just, bangers. Yes, he does. He deserves way more love than he gets in the industry as far as, like, when people bring up, like, the best artists or whatever, the artists of our time for game music. He is definitely one of those guys. I've yes. never heard a track of his I did not like. And I still, still, I will say to this day, I think Double Dragon Neon is his opus. That's the <laughs> one. That thing has some fantastic tunes. Then you get those freaking cassette tapes out and you lose your shit. It's just, it's a peach. But enough of that game. Back to my Switch Force. If you, uh, as far as the value of this goes, obviously individuals make their own value determination. But I will say, if you've only, if you're like me and you only played Mighty Switch Force on the 3DS, which means you never played Academy and you never got to see the nicer version of Hyperdrive Edition. I think this is definitely worth your money, especially because if you're also like me, you probably haven't played Mighty Switch Force since 2011, which means you don't remember the level layout. So this will probably feel like a new game to you as far as like figuring out how to get those par times. Plus, you'll get the glorious Mighty Switch Academy, which if you're like me also, you never bought because you didn't buy it on Steam. <laughs> so I think it's worth that scratch. Though, with that said, if you're the type of person where you're like, you know... I need a lot of differentiation. I need different games. I need constant upgrades and power-ups and blah, blah, blah. You won't get that here. This is a game where they give you everything you're going to get from the start on every game, and you're going to use it just to beat levels. And there's nothing wrong with that because the format and the formula is just on point. So honestly, it's hard for me to even think of a reason not to buy it unless you're just like, I've played this game out. I have no desire to just revisit these two titles and I've already played or have no interest in Mighty Switch Academy, in which case, why do you have no interest in Mighty Switch Academy? I don't understand you if you like the other two games because it's a great game. Just basically buy the freaking game. It's good. It's a good time. Awesome. Sounds good. Next game to talk about is Zombie Driver Immortal Edition, developed and published by Exor Studios, released July 25th on the Switch for $14.99. New and specially improved version of the zombie smashing hit now on Nintendo Switch. Insane mix of cars, speed, explosions, blood, and zombies. Fight through an epic narrative campaign or test yourself in the slaughter and blood race modes. Purnell, how is the Switch version of Zombie Driver? It honestly plays very well. So the premise of this game is that you are a dude, um, technically a taxi cab driver at the start of the game, who gets locked in this large, sprawling city during a zombie apocalypse. Wake me up if you heard this one before. <laughs> um, and 
as a result of being locked in, the government contacts you and says, oh, you're a gnarly dude, and you're locked in the city. Do work for us. Save lives. And you're like, I just want to kill a bunch of zombies. And thus, Zombie Driver begins. Every level takes place in the story mode of you being asked to do a thing for the government, like save host- save citizens who are barricaded in their homes, or rescue people, or investigate you know like strange phenomena. But all of these things result in one thing: killing lots of dudes. You start out every level at a home base environment. You drive to various locations. Let's say, for example, it's a level where you have to rescue people. What you'll do is you'll see markers on a map on your big HUD. And you have to drive to those locations, and you have to clear the zombies out from in front of them. You can do this by driving over them, depending on the type of zombie, because if you start fighting like more hardcore zombies, driving into them will likely damage your car. And also, if your ramming stat is not high, they will slow you down, which I actually kind of like as a gameplay mechanic for this kind of thing. I rarely play a game where hitting zombies slows you down. Um, but you have to kill them using that or weaponry that you can upgrade your cars to get, which I'll get to shortly. Um and once you clear them all out, you can go at the marker in front of the house. They'll get in your car. And once you rescued everybody, you can go back to the base. Alternatively, it might be levels where you just kill a bunch of zombies or fight a boss that's on a level. And all those things revolve around the same mechanic. Driving your car, maiming zombies, getting money and like health upgrades and stuff in order to survive the turmoil. And on every level, there's also secondary upgrades, which you can also complete and before you beat the stage. You know, why would you want to do these things? Why would you want to bother with secondary up, um, missions? Well. Every level, when you complete it, you'll earn rewards, whether it'll be cash, money, prizes, or upgrade opportunities. So, for example, you might do a level where by being the stage, you'll get $2,000 and like a ramming upgrade. And I'll explain that in a second, too. But if you fulfill the secondary objective, you'll also get a flamethrower upgrade and another $1,000. Now, when you earn these upgrades, whether it be like, you know, flamethrower level one or ramming speed or car speed level two, you don't just get them. What it allows you to do is actually upgrade your car at this point if you have the prerequisite amount of money to do so. So before you unlock the ability to get these upgrades, you can't upgrade them. It may sound annoying, but it's actually not all that bad. It's mainly meant to just kind of keep you from just grinding one level, I guess, getting a bunch of money and then saying, here we go, I'm going to upgrade my car now. Mm-hmm. Um, it's better just to say, hey, I'm playing it. I unlock the means to, and I probably have some money lying around from doing courses. I'm going to unlock some stuff. And it's not just one car either. You'll also unlock other cars, various cars that look different, possibly drive differently. And there's a number of different things you can get. You can get a flamethrower. You can get a machine gun. You can get nitro boosting for your car. You can get ramming upgrades. You can drive through more jerks. You can speed up your car so it just drives faster. And Every car upgrades differently. So some have different max levels that you can get to, which makes the cars different. And sometimes you just want to drive a car because you think it looks cool, which is also totally fine. Now, the game itself is fun. However, what I will say is that, I mean, at least me personally, this is a quick pick up and play sort of game. Like you play a few levels, you put it down, you come back later. Because whether you're doing the story mode or the slaughter mode where you're just killing a bunch of zombie waves before the level's over without dying, or you're doing the blood race where you're basically trying to outlast your opponents while you're racing around and killing zombies on a course, all the gameplay modes in this game play the same like yeah there's variations on it but you're still driving a car killing zombies getting loot like you'll get tired of it if you play it in a marathon setting but i don't think the game is meant for that i think it's meant to be picked up played a bit put down and returned to later when you want to get that rush yeah and i think it does a good job of that honestly i enjoy playing this game a fair bit um i think the voices are kind of funny because it's one of those games where everybody's like a dude and like you say, the guy's like, thanks, bro. Like, wh- what? <laughs> you, are you really going to talk to me like that? You almost died. I saved your life. I don't know. Whatever, homie. You're my boy. Bro! <laughs> Dig! Like, all right, whatever. Let's just, let's just get this party started. Give me my, Let me get your sports car. Let me get a new ride, friend. You oh got Oh, my it. God. What I want to know is how is the performance on the Switch? Does it play well? Any kind of slowdown? Any issues? I had no slowdown. Believe it or not, I had no slowdown. It performed well. Um, lots of zombies will fill the screen at different times. Um, there was never a moment of slowdown unless my car was actually slowing down because I was trying to drive through a horde when I shouldn't have. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say it might, I mean, I haven't compared it to the PC version or anything, so I can't say whether or not it took a good, if it took a hit in the graphics department or not, but the game looked visually fine to me and I didn't suffer any static slowdown or, you know, glitches or anything of the sort. It performs very well on the Switch. And mm-hmm. I played in handheld mode, as you know. Yeah. 
Well, then 15 bucks on it. What do you say? I think this is also a buy. I think it's a great time. Good way to just kind of turn over to drive your car around, kill stuff, put the game down, come back. It's just, it's a feel good, you know, zombie kill simulator. So long as you're obviously not one of the feels like, I'm so tired of zombie games. Like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> it's fun. Sounds good. Well, you're three for three. Are we going to go four for four? Maybe. Depends on the game. Well, the game is called Sweet Witches, developed by Lumen Section, published by Dragius Games, released July 27th on the Switch for $9.99. Put on your magic hat. The quest for candies has begun. Master powerful spells and tricks to be victorious on your own or with friends. Purnell, what is Sweet Witches? So, Sweet Witches... Actually, I was surprised by what it turned out to be. I didn't expect what I got, but what I got was still good. So Sweet Witches plays like an arcade-style game. Think um, the Bubble Bobbles and uh, the Parasol Stars. Basically, those games were kind of like single screen, and you're trying to fulfill a specific objective to move on to the next screen. In the case of Sweet Witches, you control one of two witches, and you're tasked with going to a stage, and each level consists of about maybe 10 individual screens. And as weird as this may sound, your goal is to plant flowers on all the plantable tiles on the stage. So we're talking, you'll be on a level that's covered in mud and there's like monsters running around trying to kill you. And you're trying to run over tiles to plant flowers. When you've planted all the flowers, the level will allow you to plant. You move on to the next section until you eventually beat the stage. It's honestly challenging yet also fun. The way the game is working aside from this is that you can you can't jump. Enemies are come in decent varieties. You have this weird like little like salamander who eats a hot pepper and it starts running around real fast to chase after you. You have slime monsters, you have succubi, you have little ice monsters, all kinds of cool stuff. And the way you fell them is two ways. One, you can lick them, in which some enemies will die from being licked. Your hat has a tongue, by the way. Um okay. you can lick them. That's <laughs> and, important information. That's right, hat tongue. <laughs> 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 um, if you lick an enemy, sometimes they'll die if they're that kind of monster. Other times they'll just get stunned, which means don't touch them, run away. I bought you some time. So, and like I said earlier, you can't jump, but what you can do is summon a ladder. And when you summon the ladder, you can climb up it. And the ladder doesn't even have to touch a, le- a, st- a, pl- a ledge above you. You can just climb up into oblivion and then just run off the side if you want, which is a good way to kind of hop over enemies. Though you have to be careful because enemies can climb ladders too. So you don't want to bank on them as being like the thing where it's like, that's how I'm going to get out. I'm going to put this ladder, climb up and then leave it. But you can only put one ladder down at a time. So when you place one ladder, the previous ladder goes away. So if an enemy's climbing at the time, they are now falling back to earth because their mode of transportation is now gone. Um, Also, there are presents that will pop up on certain stages. And when you pick them up, they will yield you one-time use items like a bear trap, which you can lay on the ground and it'll kill enemies that run over it, but it will also kill you. So watch your tukis and like a boxing glove was my favorite one. Once you just kind of throw it across the screen, if it hits a guy, it kills him. Perfect. Just one shot, knock him out. Um, the game is challenging though, because as you're running around, every stage has various hazards like ice blocks for sliding, mud blocks for slowing you down. And then every level also will introduce weird enemies. So you have to get used to their attack patterns and stuff and different gimmicks to basically stay on your toes. Each world will give you five lives, though, so you do have a fair number of lives to play around with, but if you die, you got to start the level over again. Also worth mentioning is that when you get, there's like a super meter, and whenever you max out, which I believe happens just from planting flowers, it just happens over time, you'll get access to a special power. The main witch that I was using, when she activated, she got on her broom and she could move very fast. It was a good way to try to jump around the map as fast as possible and avoid jerk bags. Um, I honestly exploited it whenever I got it. I put that thing to use because it is a very useful power. And there is also a versus mode in the game, which I didn't really do much with. I'll admit I came here mainly for the single player. But the vibe I got from the understanding of the multiplayer is that you are trying to knock the other players out and plant flowers. So you can get the, power, the presents I was talking about before and you can attack the opponents with those presents to put them down while you're planting flowers. Um, <clears throat> and you can also use the superpowers that each witch has, which, which there are four total witches in the game. And they each have a different unique power. You use those to kind of give yourself a bit of an edge when the time comes to employ them. Overall, though, I found the game to feel very arcadey in style. The music is actually good, and the animation is nice too. I was un- I was un- I was unfortunate that the little cinema snippet at the beginning of the of this game and all that don't animate; they're just like stills. But they're very cartoony. I like the art, and then when the characters are actually running around the stages, they're very well animated and cartoony. 
It's a very nice little enjoyable game to play around with. And I'm actually glad to have played it because I was eyeballing it a fair bit when I saw it in the store. So I was glad they gave us the opportunity to review it too. Well, then for nine ninety nine, what's your verdict? I think it's honestly another buy. If you're a fan of the arcade style games like I was talking about earlier, the you know clear the clear the objective for the room and then move on to the next room style games. We don't even get a lot of those very often anymore. So I think it's a good quality play. Awesome. Sounds good. Pernell, it is always a pleasure having you on. Do you have any final words before we move on with the show? Watch out for sinus infections. Those bastards are awful, and they sneak up on you, and then you start shooting mucus everywhere, and you don't know how to make it stop, and then you can't stand up straight, and then you start rambling because you don't know how to shut up, and then just things happen. It's bad. All right, moving on. Next game to talk about is called Tetsumo Party, developed and published by Monster Couch. It released July 26th on Xbox One, Switch, PC, and PS4 for $4.99. It's Tetsumo Party time. Help sumo warriors win in a hilarious competition, control their arms and legs to fit the incoming bamboo wall, or drop out in the most ridiculous way. Checking this one out. Royal Sefton, how are you doing? (laughs) I'm sweaty. You're sweaty. I'm out in the sun. Nice. Yeah. That's well, disgusting. I'm in the shade, but it's still 105, so yeah. Yeah, fuck the summer. Oh, my God. And you're in Arizona. Yeah, so three, four, or five months of ball soup. Jesus. You crazy <laughs> bastard. Uh, I love it here. <laughs> <laughs> it makes so, me wish I was dressed like a sumo, because... The, <laughs> like. <laughs> You can just it imagine you wearing cool. a sumo diaper standing outside doing this review. <laughs> just waving to people, wearing a sumo diaper, hey, people honking at you. <laughs> oh, man. So did you dress up as a sumo while you were playing Tetsumo Party? It would have been a bigger party if I had done that, but no, I did not. I regret. Um, no, so <laughs> Tetsumo Party is... Um, it's fun. It's it's kind of a, a, a one note symphony. Um, very simple. You know, you're uh, you're you're playing a, a sumo wrestler, and you have this uh, wall of bamboo, and you have to fit the silhouette. And if you don't, then you go flying ass first into the camera. So you, you know, um, that's kind of the. It's it's a very simple joke, and um and and the challenge is of course getting your arms and legs akimbo or in some other position to match that silhouette. And so you kind of rotate through different shapes that kind of look like uh, tetronomos or something, um, you know, like straight out, straight up, straight down, or some kind of L shape, you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> you drop both legs and you fall flat on your butt and, and uh, <laughs> <we can laughs> have one leg raised. And occasionally somebody will come by with sushi on a platter. And if you move your arm to pick it up, you get bonus points. It's, it's just it's it's a goofy ass game. Um as you can see, very simple, because that's pretty much the whole thing. Um, you have the ability to speed up the wall as it comes towards you, kind of like, you know, moving a Tetris piece down to the bottom more quickly. Mm. Um, same same analog there. And the faster you can uh, get to the next silhouette, the more points you get for each one. So, you know, there's a strategy behind being quick at this. Um, your score will go up uh, quite a bit faster that way. But um, I suck at this game. <laughs> <laughs> My problem is I keep moving the limb instead of bringing the wall closer once I think I've got it lined up, or I fix three limbs and then there's one that I didn't do quite right, and whoops, you know, ass first into the camera again. Uh, So, yeah, so um, every time you play, it rotates through a different uh, set of levels, and allegedly you can unlock some of the different sumo wrestlers as you get better at the game. I never got good enough at the game to really unlock anything, unfortunately. Um, What what was your high score? Oh, I don't know, like 30 something. It wasn't very good. Damn. Uh, you get, yeah, the best you, I, I was able to get was like four points on a board if I was able to get right into position and run it immediately. And if you don't accelerate the board coming at you, it's one point. So, yeah, do the math. I mean, I probably survived maybe 15 boards or something tops. Um, yeah, I was not very good at this game at all. Um, that doesn't mean that it isn't fun. I'm still, you know, I still think it's hilarious. And, you know, you can play it up to four players couch style. It's not online multiplayer that I could tell. But, I mean, it would be a party. Absolutely. Yeah. I didn't get to test multiplayer, unfortunately. It was uh, <laughs> a little, I think, frustrating for the kids. So Yeah, I can uh, imagine. It's it's like uh, that old game show Hole in the Wall. Do you remember that one? No, no, I don't. 
where they would they would have a wall coming at people and they would have to fit their body to match the shape. So really? th- it's basically a, a Tetris style version of that game. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Where in, okay. where I didn't instead know that of existed. yeah, there was a Kinect version of it as well on the 360. <laughs> And instead of using your body to position it, you have to use the the bumpers to, you know, manage the guy's arms and legs. It's it sounds really cool. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So that that would be it in a nutshell. And, and so, yeah, I mean, it is it is very playable. It's just really challenging. Basically, you press you press a button to rotate the different positions for each limb. So, you know, if you do, if you don't have quite the right one, you got to keep pressing the buttons until it cycles through to the correct uh, position, too. And yeah. so I would sometimes second guess myself or I'd try to advance it and I'd end up pressing the wrong button or something instead. Uh, so yeah, just a lot of operator error there. I, I don't know. Um, wish I was better at the game. I would have liked to have unlocked <laughs> some stuff, but I, I just, I suck too much. Well then as it stands five bucks on it, what do you think? I think that's the right price point. It's definitely a try it. And at five bucks, it's kind of a good buy it, especially if you know, you've got a few people that'll play it with you. But I can imagine that's going to be a lot more fun than just, you know, playing with yourself as well. Well, it's cheap and it's hovering between buy it and try it. Sounds like a fuck it, why not to me? Exactly. I think that hits the nail right on the head. It's cheap enough that fuck it, why not? Mm-hmm. Just buy and it. And you know that it might even go on sale on Steam if that were the case. It'd be just a no-brainer. I think even five bucks is perfectly fine. Yeah, fuck it, why not? Awesome. Sounds good. Well, Royal, we will let you get back inside to the glory of air conditioning <laughs> uh, so you could dry out the ball soups going on. Uh, do, you, do you have any final words? Next game to talk about was called Hoggy 2 Develop by Raptosoft Games, published by Rattalaka Games. It released July 23rd on PS4 and Vita, the 24th on Xbox One, 26th on the Switch for $4.99. The pink slime called Hoggy is back in a whole new wonderful world. Uh, ugh, whole new wonderful adventure awaits. Why am I losing train of thought already uh except this time around hoggy isn't on his own as hoggatha is seen to join him and the two must work together to rescue their slime mold children from the evil moon men that kidnapped them uh what a crazy storyline checking this game out jacob garner how are you doing i'm doing okay for a minute there i thought you'd forgotten my name (laughs) no i I wish uh, i could uh, oh yeah nice nice yeah (laughs) whatever I quit. <laughs> so how's Hoggy? <laughs> I'm not telling you. You've hurt my feelings. I'm sorry, Jacob. No, you're not. <laughs> I tried to sound sincere. You can't give me any credit for that. That would, uh, Let's try it again. Go to hell, Jacob. That's better. Okay. <laughs> so how's Hoggy? Dude, it is an excellent game. Um, I'm really thrilled with it. Um, especially cause I picked it up on a, like a, eh, yeah, I guess I'll review it. It's been a while since I reviewed that. Has it been a while since I reviewed things? I don't know. I feel well, like every other week or so you're on. Yeah. I don't know. I'm trying to remember what the heck the last game I reviewed was knocked. Oh yeah. Right. 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 Oh wow. That was like what last week? I don't, I don't know. Remember. Uh, just, I barely remember yesterday. Come on. Fair enough. I barely remember this morning. That's because we're old. Anyway. And, and we're both forgetting that we're talking about Hoggy. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Um, yeah. So it is a, like an insanely fun game. First off, the art's beautiful. Uh, it looks like uh, it, it's very reminiscent of Super Mario. Um, I'd pick it at like Super Mario Brothers 2 and 3 uh, level kind of graphics except it's nice like clean hd uh kind of stuff but uh yeah so it's just like you and your blob wife uh have to save your little blob children from these moon men uh who've kidnapped them for reasons that aren't i don't think that they're actually clear uh you got farther in the game than i did did it did the plot ever actually like thicken or is it just the oh god no Okay, so there's really no it's, plot it's, to it. N- it's all about the gameplay with this one. Okay, yeah. All right. So, anyway. Uh, so, you keep hopping into these little jars, and the jars are little self-contained puzzles. Ugh, excuse me, I had to burp. Nice. Thank you. Anyway. Um, 
So there's these little self-contained puzzles where you have to eat all the fruit in a room. Uh, and there's different enemies. And unless you have a certain power-up, you can't touch them. And so it's a lot of interesting trial and error uh, going through each room. Uh, I mean, the game initially starts out fairly easily. Um, and I don't know if I'd say the difficulty really ramps up. Um but it's just like, as I said, you know, you're going to have to do trial and error. And it's not so much difficulty, but uh, you'll realize, oh, I needed to break, you know, not the first and the second block, but I had to break the third block to make the enemy go in a certain direction. Or um, like one of the early levels, uh, you had to knock the eight balls in uh, a certain order to make it so the level would work out correctly. Um, and it's really ingenious. It's really fun. It's really relaxed. I, I, I'm, I'm stoked about this game. And I also really like the fact that there's like a kitty version of it, um, which has, I think 20 levels. Yep. And, uh, it's, it's honestly, it's fairly easy to blow through. I, I clocked in at 23 minutes. Um, 22 bitch. Well, now I have to go replay it just to be, <laughs> beat you at 22 minutes. Um, you know, now that I understand how the game works. And an, embar- um, an embarrassing amount of time for me was spent not realizing that you have to push down to go in the little jars. Like, I'm I'm trying to jump from the wall or from the ceiling down into it, thinking that the jump will push me into it. I was trying it, to push it from the sides to see if it knocked over. Yeah, I'll be honest, it it did take me a little bit, and so uh, none of my viewers on Mixer uh, (laughs) (laughs) uh, got to see me fail at that, Um, mainly because nobody watches me on Mixer. True. Um, (laughs) No one watches us either, so. Well, yeah, but I know, but do you ever broadcast on Mixer still? No. Or or, or do you mean nobody watches you on Twitch? Just in general. It was... (sighs) Oh, all right. You're ruining the joke, Jacob. Ruining <laughs> it. God. Anyway. Anyway, Jinx, you owe me a Coke, which I don't drink, so I'm just going to pour it out and watch you sob. The recording will show otherwise, by the way. Of, of, of what? Saying it, of, of saying it at the same time. I said oh, it first. Sh- no, you didn't. Shut up. You'll see. <clears throat> No, I won't, because that involves me having to actually play the podcast, which we both know I'm not going to do. Touche. <laughs> actually, I will, just because I like hearing the sound of my own voice. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so there, yeah, so there is the kitty version of it. Um, I haven't completed the regular version of it yet. Um, uh, I think I'm not I'm about, surprised. There's like 200 puzzles in there. It is insane. Yeah, I'm about I'm about a fourth of the way through, um, and the gameplay is pretty quick, uh, which is one of the things I like about it because it's very it's fairly um, pick up and play, uh, which I as a parent I really like that because I mean getting an hour or two each night just to be able to play video games is near impossible. But something like this, you can easily play like 10 minutes of, and you don't have to worry about checkpoints or you don't have to worry about, you know, uh, remembering how to play it. Like the gameplay is stupidly easy yet. Like it's surprisingly complex too, just because of like all the puzzles and stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I really dug it. Well, then overall, four ninety nine on this one. What do you say? Well, if you're buying it during the first week, it's I think it's only four fifty nine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, See, but either way, I don't know when those sales end, so I try not to bring them up on the show because if someone's listening a month from now, the sale price isn't there anymore. Okay, but do you think somebody's going to get mad at you? Maybe. That involves somebody having to listen. Shay once again. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so four ninety nine on Hoggy. What is your Absol- verdict? Absolutely, absolutely recommended. Honestly, I'd actually be willing to pay ten bucks for this, maybe more. I don't know, but for five bucks, that's totally sweet. And also, if you're an achievement whore, my God, this thing's got a ton of them. Uh, well, actually, it's not so much a ton of them, but they're real easy to get. Yeah. So 
fairly easy thousand. If you're good at the game, you could probably get it in an hour tops. Okay, cool. Um, I'm apparently not good at the game. Yes. That's that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob, always a pleasure having you on chatting about games. Do you have any final words? <sighs> Damn it. I thought about that, and I was just like, shit, I didn't come in here with anything to say. As per usual. All right, and finally tonight, we're bringing in our good friend Chris Taylor. Chris, how are you doing? Hey, doing just fine. Just fine, that's it? I was going to say just slime, but then I realized that <laughs> The thing I'm talking about today has to do with slime. <laughs> I was just thinking of Todd and the adventures of Todd in Slime World on the Atari Lynx. Why? Because that's what I think about, okay? <laughs> <laughs> the Atari oh, Lynx. Geez, hang man. on a second. I accidentally. Oh, would you break? I, I accidentally unplugged my headphones. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. You back? Yeah, I'm back. <laughs> how you punctuate a joke <laughs> through equipment destruction i'm so proud of you chris Mm-hmm. oh should we talk about games oh yeah why not all right you I got that's... four you got four games to talk about a nice nice big handful here heck yeah we're gonna kick things off with songbird symphony developed by joy stake studios published by p cube released july 25th on switch pc and ps4 for 16.99 a heartwarming journey of a discovery or a heartwarming journey of discovery as orphan chick burb sets off to find his true origins. Follow this cheerful little bouncing bird who revels in singing and guide him through a magical journey of stunning pixel art and gorgeous animation that shapes itself to your musical interactions. Chris, tell us about songbird symphony. All right. Songbird symphony. Well, uh, yeah, this one was actually pretty exciting to check out. It's a uh, it's a platform that kind of uses a formula that I have never seen before in that it is a rhythm game platformer. And uh, yeah, <laughs> so the game starts off uh, with you hatching it. Is, you are the uh, your burb, which is as soon as I figured out that was the name of the protagonist. That's when I was like, yes, I want to play this game. <laughs> Absolutely. That's so that's so internet. And uh I thought that it would be a jokier game, but it's kinda not. It's actually, as they say, heartwarming. It's uh it's basically you hatch and uh you the first thing you see is your Uncle P P E A, so short for Peacock. And uh you kind of go through this uh, stage the first stage to go and uh, talk to him because now you're like kind of uh, a child bird a, a little chick as it were and um, you know you run into your uncle and talk to him and he teaches you how to uh, play the game basically he teaches you a song and a dance like how to do his special dance and uh, that's where you kind of learn the mechanics of the game and where you learn in the story that you are not actually a peacock <gasps> and it's yeah it's a dun 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 moment, but uh, Burb is an unshakable optimist and is uh, really excited to find out what he actually is. So the game is largely going through uh, platform stages and then meeting up with a quote unquote boss at the end who uh, you kind of you they sing their song at you and uh, and you learn their dance and you learn their song and every song you learn after a different level. Uh, basically unlocks a new button in the rhythm game section. Uh, so I'm going to rewind it a little bit and talk about the rhythm game section. So uh, it's fairly simple. Uh, they play a song and the the bird quote unquote sings the melody at you. Um, but there's it's done through subtitles with a bouncy ball. So it's kind of like it's almost karaoke style. It's like you can sing it yourself, <laughs> uh, but nobody has any voices in this game. So, well, other than bird chirping, of course. And, uh, and then, yeah, they, uh, they start doing the melody again. Only you're supposed to push a button, um, in time after they say something. So they say something and then you repeat it. It's kind of like Parappa the rapper. Mm. Um, so like, you know, when you're doing your, um, when you're doing your uncle's song and dance, uh, you basically follow the bouncing ball. So when the ball bounces onto your, um, onto the image of the up button, then you push the up button in time, and then it, uh, and then it does that. 
fairly simple. And uh, the other thing is that, you know, anytime you push that up button while you're running around the levels and jumping, uh, Burb will tweet that note. And there are certain puzzles in the actual game where you do have to, you know, tweet the note in a certain rhythm or a certain amount of times. Uh, sometimes you have to tweet twice at a, uh, at like a, an NPC to talk to them. Um, but one thing becomes really apparent as soon as you actually start, you know, playing through this game, there is no violence at all. There are no enemies. Um, all you do is you basically create interactions that change the tune of the level a little bit. Um, so let's say you, uh, you have like a, I can't remember what it was. If it was like a, it was some kind of insect. Oh, it was a bee. A bee's looking for flowers. So you run into this bee and he's like, can you help me? And he's like, I need to find some flowers. And then, you know, you run along with this bee following you until you find a room full of flowers. And, uh, what, you know, you get thanked and then you get a musical note. And if you collect all the musical notes, then you can, you know, I don't know. I guess that's how you 100% the game or move on or something. <laughs> there's four in each level, though. So there's four interactions that you can do in every level. Um, but once you get that bee into that uh, room of flowers, there's spiders along the top of the uh, screen that each dip down to try and get the bee while he's getting the flowers. They're, but they're not actually, they never catch him. But when they come down, it creates a beat that is now in the song for the rest of the level. That's cool. Yeah, so every interaction adds something else to the music until you have the fully formed song. And then, like I said, you go and talk to the boss, and then they they do their thing, and you talk to them. And yeah, like I said, the second level, um, you find out, you know, now you can use the uh, the triangle button as well as the up button. You know, triangle on the PlayStation 4, of course. And, uh, you know, you basically have to then start using both of those buttons to win the stage, but then you realize that instead of the bouncing ball, it's actually uh, slightly different. And in fact, every time that you uh, have a dance off or sing off or whatever with the uh, with the, I hard to say the boss of the level. I guess it's kind of the boss of the level, <laughs> but because uh, they're like they're friendly and they want to help you. That's the thing. <laughs> they're not really, you know, it's not like grr, you have to defeat me. It's like oh, let me help you by teaching you this song and dance. Um, because you find out that you're, you know, you, you kind of start to find out that you're a special kind of bird because not every kind of bird can learn all the songs of other birds and you're collecting their songs, which is how you get those extra notes. Um, oh. you know, which I haven't beaten the game, but considering that Burb looks like a mockingbird, <laughs> I think that might be the case, but that might be, that's my own conjecture. I actually don't know. I haven't seen the end of this game yet, but I will say that I want to see the end of this game because this thing is freaking gorgeous. Um, you can look at any screenshot of it, but I also recommend watching videos. It is so well animated and like the pixel art is just unbelievable. It's just one of those rare games where, you know, you start to, you know, you like you're sitting there watching it and you're just like, I, this isn't even like, you know, Nothing's really all that difficult in this game, but I'm so enjoying it because I'm just going through and seeing all these neat things and like, you know, all this beautiful stuff. And, you know, it's all kind of unfolding into something, you know, you're just fixated by the game. Exactly. And aesthetically, yeah, it's it absolutely nails it. It's just like this, um, you know, 16 bits style graphics turned up to 11, <laughs> like, you know, just something that. Look like it could have been on the Super Nintendo if the Super Nintendo was like three times as powerful. <laughs> so. Well, then sixteen ninety nine on this one. What do you think of it? I say do it. I recommend this game for sure because not only is it a unique experience, which I always, um, I always enjoy that. Um, it, clearly, a lot of love went into it, and it's just like, yeah, it's a feel good game, and I think that's really worth something. And I really want to see what else these. Uh, this developer, you know, comes out with um, because, yeah, this this game is great and also like one thousand percent appropriate for children. I would absolutely want to want a young person to play this game. Nice. So good for all ages. Yes. Sweet. 
Next game to talk about is called Super Mega Baseball 2 Ultimate Edition, developed and published by our friends at Metalhead Software, released July 25th on Switch for $29.99. Deep skill curve, visceral pacing, lighthearted vibes, serious simulation. The Ultimate Edition on the Nintendo Switch includes the complete set of Super Mega Baseball 2 content featuring fully online play and runs at 60 FPS on both docked and handheld modes. Uh, we, we love our super mega baseball on SML and Chris, we're hoping that you enjoyed it as well. <laughs> How is it I on did. the switch? It is. It's great on switch. Um, yeah, I played, uh, through this in docked mode and in TV mode and it actually ran pretty well on both. I don't know about the 60 frames at all times. Sometimes the cinematics would slow down a little bit, but I noticed that's kind of par for the course for these kind of games. I don't know enough about development to be able to speak to that really. Yeah. It was just it was just funny that that's one of their bullet points. I don't know. <laughs> well, was the gameplay uh, nice and smooth at least? Yes, absolutely. That's the important uh, so, part. Yeah, so here's the thing about me and baseball is that I go all the way back to the NES game Baseball, <laughs> which had you playing baseball. You just picked some teams. I don't, nobody had names or anything. You just picked teams and that determined your colors. They were vaguely based on the colors that, like, some of the major league baseball teams had at the time. But apart from that, that was it. You know, you just, you took turns batting and pitching. And if you, you know, it, it was all like top down and like very, very generic. And I don't know, for some reason, I always liked that the most. Like I played all of the bases loaded. I played bad news, baseball, baseball stars. I've played uh base war cyber stadium. And all of those are fantastic, but I keep coming back to just baseball. <laughs> I don't know what it is. And uh, on the Game Boy Advance, I actually bought a game called Baseball Advanced because <laughs> it was equally just generic baseball. It had nothing to do with any teams or anything like that. It was just baseball on the Game Boy Advanced. Like, do you want it? Okay, there it is. So I, based on that, I was very um, excited to try out a game called Super Mega Baseball Ultimate Edition. Because not only is it generically just titled baseball, there's like three like gold star words surrounding it. <laughs> Super mega and ultimate. And uh, yeah, so I actually don't know anything about the first game. I only just looked it up and just saw that this game definitely keeps on the tradition of kind of like weird looking character like models. Um, but I, that's not to its detriment because again, I'm not looking for a realistic baseball experience. I'm looking for one that I can play, um, yeah. just pick up and play. And sure enough, I was very, um, so for one thing, <laughs> they were like, you know, I was going to go through the whole tutorial and instructions and all this other stuff. And they're like, we really recommend you just play the game. And so I uh, I went back and actually just started a an exhibition game, which is just, you know, one game against the computer and you just choose how many innings you want. And uh, sure enough, as soon as I started it, it just gave me tutorials like while I was going and everything's really easy to control. Um, basically, you kind of have a few choices on how to uh, interface with the character. So if you're at bat, uh, of course, there's the square in front of the pitcher, and that's, you know, the the ball's going to be somewhere in or out of that square. If it's in the square, then it'll be a strike, and if it's out of the square, it'll be a ball. And then you can just try and swing at it either way. Um, you know, rules of baseball, I'm yeah. <laughs> not going to go into it. <laughs> um, hopefully, if you're picking up this game, you already know a thing or two about how baseball is played. I would hope so. Maybe. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know how any other sports are played, so I can't I can't judge you if you don't know. Um, but yeah, so it's that. And with the right stick, sorry, with the left stick, you're actually uh, you have a little kind of a cursor that you move around and that will determine where you're kind of aiming with your bat. And then you can either just push the A button for a basic slam, you know, just you push the A and he swings the bat. And if it hits the ball, then it's a pretty good hit. Um, then, optionally, you can also hold the Y button down and it will actually uh, do a power meter, like going up and down. And the closer you get that power meter to 99, the harder the swing. So then it becomes a timing game. And you can actually also do this by holding, uh, or sorry, by holding down, yeah, down on the right stick and then pushing up 
to swing. So you have like a few different options on how you want to do that, but you can you don't have to do the timing thing. You can just push A and attempt to hit the ball. Uh, so I really appreciate that they give you that kind of option. And then of course you can bunt it like a like a fool <laughs> if you really really want to. I guess that can factor in. Uh, same thing with pitching. It's basically the right stick. Uh, when it's your turn to pitch, you select the type of pitch with the right stick. And then uh, you can either do a powered uh, um, pitch and try to aim for the most powerful uh, or just push the button and throw the ball. Uh, then with the cursor, again, you're moving a cursor inside of a box. You try to get the cursor um, to touch the position of the ball. So it's like basically if you're throwing a curve ball, then you're the ball you can see that the ball is going to be over to the right so you try to move the cursor over to the right while you're pitching and the closer you get um before act- the ball actually leaves the pitcher's hand the um more power the like more accurate the pitch and sometimes an inaccurate pitch will work really well but you know you obviously want to try for accuracy yeah uh, to get the most control so you know it's just different things like that and um you it actually also has a thing where okay so Part of any baseball game is how is the outfield handled? Um, this is one thing I liked about baseball on the NES is that it was all done automatically. Um, you know, your guys just went, you know, went the and just like ran, you know, <laughs> across the outfield to like catch the ball. And if they didn't, they didn't. And if they did, then you, you know, you can go from there. Uh, in this game, you can control the outfield. But you can also just have them kind of control themselves. And the uh, there's actually a setting, and it's called Ego. The higher you set the Ego, the more control you're kind of forced to have over the players. So it's kind of like the difficulty of the game. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you set your Ego down all the way, then they're going to be more or less fully automatic. And you can, you can control them, but they're really better off just <laughs> being controlled by themselves. They don't need your interference. Um, so, you know, like the first time I played with a little bit higher ego and then I lowered the ego, um, turns out I'm bad at this game either way. <laughs> I mean, I had, you know, I just need to play it more, but I'm kind of bad at all baseball games. That's the thing. Um, but yeah, so I really enjoy how this game actually interfaces. Like it, it does various other things like stealing bases and, you know, catching base stealing and, you know, uh, how to pitch to different bases, and each of those has a power meter too. It all ends up being very intuitive and very friendly. And uh, like I said, you can play exhibitions. Um, you know, you can play like an actual whole season. You can also play online. Uh, you can play couch multiplayer on pretty much every mode. And uh, I believe, at least you told me, <laughs> that the uh, the DLC that's included with the Ultimate Edition is, like, basically character creation. Yeah, there's a lot of character customization stuff in the game. If you go and do a full season, you could create your own team, or you yeah. could use the ones that are in the game, but there's a lot of room for customization if you want it in this game. Yeah, I definitely recommend going through and actually creating a team if you're going to go through a whole season and things like that, because, I mean, the characters all basically look like, you know, they were kind of thrown into a blender, <laughs> like this hairstyle, this face style, this skin color, and you know it sometimes doesn't end up working very well. Although I love, uh, I love some of the names that they came up with with some of these characters, like the generic names. They had like Bunt and Manly, <laughs> one, and uh, I think I took down a couple of others, but I don't know. Anyway, yeah, I always am a sucker for like excellent creative names, um, especially bad ones. I didn't take the screenshot. Dang it. Okay, never mind. <laughs> thought I took a screenshot of one of them. So, uh, yeah, all around, like, this is basically exactly what I look for in a baseball game. That is to say, um, it's ridiculous. It has nothing to do with real life, but it's fun and it's accessible. And, you know, I actually want to get into it without having to have, like, all this knowledge of, like, actual baseball outside of it. Um, so for that reason, I think it's pretty swell. Well, then your overall verdict for 30 bucks. Well, for 30 bucks, I should think that maybe they're going to come out with a physical edition. Do we know? I'm not sure. It was 30 bucks on Xbox and PS4 as well. So it's not a different price tag. Okay. Oh, no switch tax. Well, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, for plus 30 you bucks, got all the DLC, which is nice. 
Yeah, exactly. I think thirty bucks is fair, um, for sure. Like, um, especially if this is one that you're planning on playing online, it looks like it has a pretty good online community, and um, you know, of course, couch multiplayer. But yeah, this is definitely the kind of baseball game, and I mean, it's half the price of whatever licensed sports game. Which do they even have any licensed baseball games anymore? Uh, there's two of them. There's the show on PS4. And then they have the RBI series, which hasn't gotten the greatest reviews. Okay, so this is like half the price of like one of those when they're new and you can play online and with multiplayer. And yeah, I think this is a uh, this is a great entry level, like, you know, kind of baseball game for people like me who love the sport, but don't like watching it. (laughs) Awesome. Sounds good. Well, the next game to talk about is called Alien Escape, developed by No Fuel Games. In Karayan Games, published by Karayan Games, released July 12th on the Switch for $4.99. In this puzzle platform adventure, Timmy uses his abilities to influence gravity, escape from the gruesome castle, save his friends, and defeat evil. Chris, what is Alien Escape? Alien Escape. Well, for one, I didn't know that the character's name was Timmy. That's pretty great. (laughs) Um, yeah, so these aliens run out of fuel and in this, uh, nice little kind of 8 bit looking cinematic, uh, intro, which I really appreciated. Um, they run out of fuel and they crash land on this, on this strange planet Earth, uh, in front of a castle and then they knock on the door. I guess they're gonna try and ask for space fuel door to door. And it is, uh, answered by none less than the Grim Reaper. I suppose. <laughs> I mean, it looks like the Grim Reaper without the scythe, scythe, whatever. Uh, and yeah, he, uh, he ends up throwing them in the dungeon. And so you have to escape from this castle dungeon with an alien. Um, so yeah, like the way, you know, this is a room by room, uh, platform puzzle game. So you have to get, um, let's see. Yeah. You have to get to the exit of the, uh, of the stage. Like you have to grab the key first and then that opens the door and then you have to get into the door and leave. Um, so along the way, obviously there are obstacles and everything like that, but the way that you interface with the game is that you actually turn the entire room around in order to, um, proceed. Like you can't jump, you can only walk from side to side and there are no attacks. Uh, so therefore, like you have to end up manipulating the stage and yourself in ways where you can actually get to the key and then to the exit without actually dying. Um, and of course, in your way, there'll be everything from like spikes to, uh, boxes, which then you have to like creatively use in order to get over like spikes and traps and things like that. And it actually gets really advanced, but yeah, that's more or less the, um, the, the thrust of it is that you're basically, um, you know, turning the room around. It reminds me of like one of those like kind of puzzles where you have to like try to get a ball in the hole by turning the entire puzzle. Mm. So it's it's really like that in video game form. Um, it's got lots of levels, uh, which I really like. It has like these branching paths and stuff. Um, oh no, it doesn't. I'm sorry. That's the other game. <laughs> <laughs> I'm mean, getting them confused. So the last two games in here are a little bit similar. <laughs> I'm giving it away right now. Uh, no, this one actually uh, it goes level by level, like, you know, numbered levels, but there are still a lot of them, I, you know. Um, the way that, you know, you get through the level, if you can get to the exit, then you win the level and you can move on, but there's actually three stars uh, ratings for each level, so the th- ways that you're judged are that, you know, if you get out of the level and if you get out in um, a certain amount of room turns... So if you can get out in the least amount of room turns, then you get that star. And then if you get out under a certain time, then you get that star. And uh, I'm not sure what all those lead up to. I'm sure some kind of achievement or something like that. But I've been definitely replaying levels to try and get those stars because, you know, you need the stars. I need them. Goddamn stars. Yep. Oh, man. But overall, five bucks on this one. What do you think of it? Five bucks. This one is a nice, uh, you know, quick to get into kind of game. It's a uh, relatively simple, which you know one would expect from a game in that price range for sure. And it, um, and you know, actually features quite a lot of content. So yeah, I'd say go for it. It's a nice looking little game, and uh, I found it pretty charming. Um, it does get difficult too. So for people who enjoy, you know, single room 
platform puzzle games, then for sure this one will get you going. And get your money's worth, huh? Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, one final game to talk about tonight is called Robbie Swifthand in the Orb of Mysteries, developed by Pixel Rain, published by Kiss Publishing. <laughs> Released August 1st on the Switch for $17.99. Plan your every move and outsmart the traps that are lurking in the temple or get dissected in hilarious ways. A hardcore 2D platformer that will mess with your mind. Chris, tell us about Robbie Swifthand. Okay, Robbie Swifthand. Well, for one, you're playing a thief, and I think Robbie Swifthand is a great name for a thief. Yeah, uh, it is. Yeah, pretty fantastic. Um, so, yeah, Robbie Swifthand is another... Um, room by room puzzle platformer. Now this one isn't like single screen. Uh it actually does have, you know, some uh some size to the levels. And yeah, you basically end up kidnapped by a, you know, you're a you're a thief of some sort. I don't I mean the the only way I know his name is through the title. Like it never actually says in the game. He just seems to be a thief. Um but yeah, Robbie is teleported to this uh temple by a some kind of spirit thing, which tells him that, you know, there's this evil force about to awaken and he's the only one who can stop it by collecting these three orbs and these three temples. And, you know, he, of course, changes the subject into will there be treasure and rewards and stuff. It's a very Wario-like moment. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, sure enough, you go through and, you know, you got your greedy guy and uh, you try to get him through these stages. So the way it works is that you basically have... um a you you know you run from side to side you ju- do a regular jump and then you can duck and do another like higher jump and uh with the higher jump you can like cling on to a wall and uh and you know then kind of wall jump to something else and uh the whole point of the game is to find a it's like a glowing orange orb kind of thing um and once you find that then you find a larger orange orb and then you throw the smaller orb at it and uh which of course is another move that he has and then once that happens it opens the gate to the next level um whereupon you can um like this one actually does have branching paths so you know a couple levels in and you're able to like actually branch out and do other things uh which makes me believe that this game probably has um you know a lot of different uh, levels of difficulty, I'm sure, as you go into a certain direction. Uh, personally, of course, I was trying to unlock all of them, so I just kept going back and, you know, choosing the <laughs> other one every time. Um, but yeah, each um, orb that you get, you know, leads you to the actual orb that will take down this bad guy, and then uh, you're all set. So in your way, in these stages, are all kinds of instant kill death traps. Um, yay! Yay! So, like, spikes coming out of the ground, uh, you know, like, pendulum, bladed pl- pendulum swinging around that you have to be able to jump through, um, you know, just falling blocks from the ceiling and all these other kind of things that, you know, you may or may not actually be able to see until they kill you. <laughs> um, a lot of trial and error in this one. Yeah, it seems like there's a little bit of memorization involved in some of this. Um, but if you play especially well, then if you can find like certain walls where you can't see the outline of the actual wall, like it's just darkness, um, a lot of the times you can get in there and actually find a coin, which is, uh, some kind of bonus that I actually don't know what it does, but he seems, he literally has this like giant grin on his face if you collect one. So clearly they're, they're, it's good to have because, you know, he is a thief. So, you know, you got to get that money. Yeah, boy. Gotta make the money moves. Um, so yeah, death comes swiftly and often. And interestingly enough, uh, so it, it counts. It actually has a death counter, which makes me think that you know that's going to play into the late game in some way. Uh, but interestingly enough, if you die, let's say you get hit by a pendulum, um, which you know, like ninety nine out of a hundred times, it will be a pendulum. But uh, <laughs> the hit. I haven't figured out the hitboxes on those things, really. I just keep getting killed by them. Um, but yeah, like if you get killed by that thing, then the next time you go into the stage, you'll actually see the ghost of your prior uh, Robbie Swift hands, like just still swinging from the pendulum. Oh, God. So it's pretty interesting. Uh, the whole thing's cartoony, though. So it's, you know, even though it's blood splattery, it's not really like it's not Boring. as visceral. 
Yeah, it's not as visceral as these games tend to be, which I'm fine with that. That's a nice, you know, change of pace. Which, by the way, in the Alien Escape one, if you get squished by a box and you, it just does this like green like splat that's like really terrible <laughs> um, so both these games kind of had that again these games were like sort of similar and i played them both at the same time so that's why i got a little mixed up with them uh nice. so this one this one actually has a couple of details i really like about it um well for one i actually quite like the soundtrack um and for two it's like i said it's it's hand animated it looks like like basically the sprite is is drawn and, you know, I it's a it's a pretty cool little style. Uh, what I really like about it is that it has dynamic lighting. So if you're in front of an orange, you know, fiery torch, then he'll have like orange like glow on him. Like he'll actually, you know, you'll see the orange light like on the side of his face or something like that. Um, if you get him too near a pendulum, his facial expression changes to where he's nervous. <laughs> And like I said, if you pick up a coin, then his facial expression is like big and beaming and all this other stuff. So it, you know, despite what the game might look like initially, because, you know, you we've seen a lot of puzzle platformers. So it's kind of like, you know, you see a sprite in a puzzle platform. You're like, OK, it's a sprite based puzzle platformer. But really, there's a lot of little details here that I think they put into the aesthetics that make it um, really cool. And like I said, I really like that it does have the dynamic lighting and it does have the different facial expressions for different things. It really makes the character feel more alive than I think he would normally. So, yeah, yeah, there's some quality here. Awesome. So 18 bucks on it. What do you think? Well, (laughs) uh, 18 bucks is I'm I'm not sure where it's uh, like it might be the the sheer amount of content, which I'm not exactly sure. Like it has a lot of levels just for the first orb, so I think that might be where the price tag is coming from on that one. But I didn't know I didn't think it was an eighteen dollar game while I was playing it. But I would say that yeah, if you get into this game and you're fine with the uh, with the level of difficulty, which by the way, it's got three levels of difficulty. It's got hard, not so hard, and insane. <laughs> so. And it says, and like, it gives you descriptions of the, of the actual, uh, things. And the hard one was actually really hard. Like, I, you know, got several levels in, but then kind of hit a wall. And, uh, so I put it on not so hard and started a different game. And it was like, this is for people who have never played a platformer before. <laughs> and I was, I was still dying. So, nice. uh, folk, folks who enjoy that kind of game, I think this one is a really good one to, to look into for sure, because, um, like I said, I like a lot of the little touches that went into this one. And, you know, when it comes to something like a puzzle platformer, especially like a high difficult one with single death kills or single hit deaths and things like that, like you really do want to look for the little details yeah. that uh, that make them stand apart. So I think, yeah, it's good. Uh, at 18 bucks, I'd say, um, you know, do your shopping. You know, I'd say it's probably a try it, but a really... Re- a really recommended try it, uh, but buy it if you are into this kind of game already. Awesome. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Well, that is it for this episode. Chris, thank you as always for coming on and doing your thing. Thanks again per- to uh, Pernell, Jacob, and Royal for all doing their thing as well. Uh, thanks for, for being here on my trek to 500 and now the, the move on to, I don't know, like 510, I guess. That's our next 600. goal. 666. Yes. That's the next goal. Pretty much, probably, yeah. I, I can't wait to see the song that we get for that. Uh, there's only one song that you're going to get for that. <laughs> but, yeah. But, yeah, here's the 500 more. <laughs> ¶¶